Good evening and welcome. My name is Chase Rend. I'm the executive director here at the National Building Museum. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the museum for this very special occasion. The presentation of the 13th annual Vincent Scully Prize to William Riley, former administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. I would like to start by recognizing the jury members who selected Administrator Riley for this year's honor. Jury Chair, DC-based architect David Schwarz, Ned Kramer, Editor-in-Chief of Architect Magazine, New York-based architect Deborah Burke, Gary Haney, design partner Skidmore, Owings & Merrill, and also a trustee of the National Building Museum, and Miami-based architect and urban planner Elizabeth plater Zyberk, who was a past recipient of the Vincent Scully Prize along with her partner Andres Duani in 2004. David, Ned, Liz, and Gary are all here with us tonight, so I welcome all of you and thank you for your work. I want to commend the jury for their inspired choice of tonight's honoree. The jury recognized Administrator Riley's commitment to smart environmental planning, comprehensive land use, and preservation of open space. Under his leadership, the Environmental Pro Protection Agency increased the national profile of environmental concerns. As a presidentially appointed member of the Presidio Trust, he worked to successfully transition this historic property into the urban fabric of San Francisco. And as president of the World Wildlife Fund and now chairman emeritus, he has helped to preserve open space and critical habitats across the world. Upon learning of Mr. Riley's selection for the Scully Prize, Charles Holliday, a fellow board member of the World Wildlife Fund and chairman of Bank of America Corporation, wrote a congratulatory note. In it, he made a particularly pertinent observation. Mr. Holliday said, Bill has a way of seeing around the curve and anticipating what others can't imagine. I suspect this is exactly why he has been so impactful during his career. The namesake of tonight's prize is Vincent Scully. Unfortunately, Vince is unable to join us in person tonight. He wrote to tell me how delighted he is that we are honoring Administrator Riley this evening, and he asked me to read this to you. And I quote, it is especially appropriate that William Riley should receive this prize at precisely this time. As an official in government and nonprofit service, he has consistently fought to defend and preserve the natural environment, which is at present so savagely threatened by political demagoguery and private greed. It is important that in making this award to Mr. Riley, the National Building Museum is recognizing that all human planning and building must be based on a harmonious relationship with the natural world, which has to be constantly defended. Despite his physical absence tonight, Vince's influence looms large. For me, as director of the National Building Museum, our dedication to shed light on the critical importance of architecture and design for the general public means we share a very important mission with Vince and his life's work. The Vincent Scully Prize was established in 1999 under the leadership of David Schwarz, nationally renowned architect and chair of the Scully Prize jury. Fittingly, the prize recognizes exemplary practice, scholarship, or criticism in architecture, landscape architecture, historic preservation, or urban design. It is with David's vision and the vision of the entire Scully jury that the Scully Prize has become one of the most significant awards in the architecture and design fields. Please join me now in welcoming David Schwarz to the stage. David? Originally, I was not going to write a speech tonight um, because I felt that I knew Bill well enough to uh, um, be able to talk, and I thought I knew Bob well enough to be able to talk. Um, today, we had the jury to choose next year's winner, and uh, somebody who hadn't been present at the deliberations asked me why we had given Bill um, the award. <coughs> and in my conversation, I 
sort of did a monologue for about 15 minutes on how special Bill is and why he was the uh, perfect person to win the award. It became clear to me that I probably couldn't count on doing that twice in one day, um, so I figured I really should write something. Um, it really is my pleasure to add my welcome to you all to Chase's for the celebration of this year's Scully Prize. I am sure most of you are aware that um, this prize was created to recognize and celebrate those people who have made a truly significant contribution to the built environment. Vince Scully, the prize's namesake, um, and our first honoree exemplifies the kind of person we wish to recognize and the kind of endeavor in life's work we think is important to celebrate. We all inhabit and share an increasingly small space. How we use it, how we alter it, how we adjust it to ourselves and our lives influences not only our own lives, but the lives of future generations to come. Discourse and discussion about the how, how we change and shape that environment is critical to doing so responsibly and critical to, make, critical to making sure we do so in a manner that increases the common good. In these principles, the Scully Prize recognizes individuals and is de dedicated to trying to promote these ideas and ideals. Every year, the folks here at the Building Museum send me a document that is titled Select Suggested Remarks. Uh, usually, they're really quite helpful because I don't know the people who are the winners and I don't know the people who are going to speak. This year, however, I feel privileged in having known both the winner and the person who will introduce him for quite some time now. I've had the privilege of knowing both of them and having them be a part of my life and had a, the privilege of having them add to my understanding of the built environment personally. William K. Riley is truly one of the most remarkable men I have ever known. To simply recite his resume is enough to impress. With degrees from Yale, Harvard, and Columbia, he started out at Urban America. He then became a senior staff member to the President's Council on Environmental Policy and went on to head the Conservation Foundation and later the World Wildlife Fund. When he decided to leave public service, he founded Aqua International, a public-private partnership to bring clean drinking water to some of the world's most disadvantaged people. But it's not simply his resume that makes Bill so singular. It's not Bill's resume that makes him truly unique. What is truly noteworthy about Bill that he has existed at the intersection of opposing views on some of the most important issues of our day. He is a Republican environmentalist, something that many would consider to be an oxymoron. Yes, you're supposed to laugh there. <laughs> he was, and, and yet, and better yet, as a Republican, he was appointed as a, by a Democrat to investigate the Deepwater Horizon disaster in the Gulf. He is an environmentalist that was appointed to help guide the development of the very environmentally sensitive Presidio National Park in San Francisco. He has been one of the most outspoken critics of the cruise industry, and yet he was asked to serve on the board of Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. He has been one of the most vocal advocates for renew renewable energy, yet he was asked by the Texas Electric Utility to, get, um, to help them come to be responsible producers of energy and is the chair of their Sustainability Advisory Board. To add the com to this complexity, who would expect the Chairman of Emeritus of the World Wildlife Fund to also be on the board of ConocoPhillips Petroleum and the DuPont Corporation? Bill is a man who always strives for the best, but who does not let that stand in the way of achieving the good when that is all that is possible. As importantly, though, he is also a man who is never willing to let good enough um, be acceptable simply because it's expedient. To those of us who know him, perhaps the most important thing about Bill is that he is a truly wonderful man. He is just, kind, virtuous, and loyal. He is one of the few men I know today who is a true humanist. He is an excellent husband, a wonderful father, and the best friend one could have ever ask for. To boot, he is also a great raconteur. If any of you have the opportunity to corner him at any point, or this evening if you are so fortunate, don't forget to ask him a story about his plane ride with Princess Diana. It's well worth hearing. <laughs> he has known princes and presidents, and what's most amazing about Bill is that when he sits down with you or me, he feels just like one of us. Bill is the embodiment of all the Scully Prize represents and hopes to promote. He has been the voice of reasoned discourse on issues that are usually steeped in irreconcilable dogma. He, has been the, um, he is a man who has been steeped 
uh, and cause the world around him to think about solutions and not just talk about them. He has, he has crafted consensus when at the outset all the people have seen is a chasm of disagreement. And post, perhaps most importantly, he has existed at the intersection of the world of the built environment and the natural environment and helped the two to coexist more harmoniously. Those are just a few of the reasons the jury decided that Bill was the paradigmatic and perfect person to give this award to. In looking for an, somebody who was concerned about the environment, we also wanted to find somebody who was concerned about the built environment. The resolution of the complexities of these two issues is a singularly important task for all of us today. Given all that I've said about Bill, it is only appropriate that someone who is on his way to becoming the Renaissance man that Bill is today introduce him. Uh, again, I have known Bob since I first opened my architecture practice here in D.C. Um, at the time, he was one of the founders of um, Don't Tear It Down, which has subsequently become the D.C. Historic Preservation League. And I would have to say that when we first met, we were not necessarily sitting on the same side of the table. Uh, <laughs> He uh, was at the Office of Management and Budget, served at the National Endowment for the Arts, and was Chief of Staff to Daniel Patrick Moynihan. He was the Vice President of the American Institute of Architects, and for the second time now, he is the Commissioner of, Public, uh, of the GSA. And as importantly to those of us who are architects, he was the uh, founding guiding light behind the Design Excellence Program. And for those of you who are consumers of public buildings, you can be thankful for him for making them far more pleasant than they ever would, would have been without him. Uh, it's also noteworthy that uh, Bob was last year's recipient of the very prestigious Henry Hope Reed Award. So I hope you all will join me in welcoming Bob to the stage. Thank you, David. That was very kind. And I, I assure you we did not uh, collude on this introduction, but you're going to hear a theme. Where does one start in an introduction of William K. Riley? The list of his appointments, achievements, and affiliations is dizzying and could make up an entire introduction, yet still not reflect why we honor him tonight with the Vincent Scully Prize. So I'll start arbitrarily with when I first heard of Bill Riley, which was pretty close to the beginning of his career anyway. In 1974, I had just started a job at the Federal Architecture Project, a contract outpost of the National Endowment for the Arts. Fortunately for me, the position had been vacated by Gordon Binder, who Bill Riley had just hired to work with him at the Conservation Foundation. Gordon, who deserves his own recognition, has since been one of Bill's tr trusted advisors and collaborators. Lois Craig, director of the Federal Architecture Project, had known Bill when he was at Urban America. She would tell me about this young yet prescient urbanist and environmentalist who was changing the way people thought about metropolitan areas. At that time, it had been only a year since the release of the report, The Use of Urban Land, edited and mostly authored by Bill Riley. Bill had been the executive director and Lawrence S. Rockefeller, the chairman of the Task Force on Land Use and Urban Growth of the Citizens Advisory Committee on Environmental Quality, which published the report. Mind you, cities were considered to be in decline, perhaps fatally so. City populations were plunging. For those activists who might otherwise have been the few friends of the city, growth had become a bad word. The use of urban land report saw past all that. It posited that America's urban areas would continue growing and that we needed to learn how to make them grow better. It took nascent stop the freeway and even nascent no growth uprisings as positive signs that the poor quality of post-war regional development was being reconsidered. The report worried about and recommended antidotes for policies that were relegating lower income groups to the worst part of metropolitan areas, denying them a decent place to live. It contemplated, above all, how to reconcile urban growth with a responsible use of land and conservation of open space. Mind you, this is less than four years after the initiation of environmental impact statements and Bill is already contemplating nimbyism, smart growth, and environmental justice, as we would today name the issues he was putting in play. Throughout his career, in which he is perhaps better known for his innovative work on preventing and reducing pollution, one can see a theme. Bill's environmentalism is place-based. 
he thinks in ecosystems, not just for their own sake, but for the sake of sustaining safe, productive, and uplifting environments to meet human needs and to make better places to live and work. Whether it has been fostering cleanup of the Chesapeake, crafting market-based solutions to pollution reduction, or rejecting a dam and forcing a revolution in Western states' water policy, Bill has thought globally and acted humanistically. Bill was one of the founding lights of Partners for Levable Places, which refocused our attention on urban placemaking by highlighting the magnetic power of urban amenities. Perhaps nowhere did Bill's passions for open space conservation and urban vibrancy come together better than at the Presidio in San Francisco. Bill served on the Presidio Trust when many were at a loss to figure out how, to, how this gem of a former army post, so long an off-limits enclave in its city, could become an urban asset without sacrificing its open space or its historic buildings and landscapes. Bill insisted that no such self-defeating choices were necessary. I believe he is going to speak about his experience with the Presidio this evening, and I'd encourage all of you to go see it for yourself. You have a teaser right on the screen at this moment. Finally, in this time in Washington, when it is anything but common for honor to come to someone who genuinely understands both sides of an issue and who is respected by proponents on both sides, it is reassuring to know that Bill Riley is being honored. He stands for something we seem to have forgotten, that one can respect differing points of view and still determinedly and successfully pursue one's own vision of what needs to be done. Perhaps Bill's career and character stand for more, for the proposition that making connections between opposing points of view is precisely how one successfully pursues a vision of a better world. Ladies and gentlemen, the honorable, the most honorable, Bill Riley. Wow. Well, you know, if you go home now, it doesn't get any better. <laughs> Golly. Uh, those are, without any question, the most generous, kindest um, introductions I have ever had. And I am very moved and very grateful to David and to Bob for that. <clears throat> I, um, I'd like to begin by complimenting those who named and financed this prize in recognition of Professor Scully. It is a very generous and fitting recognition of a uniquely inspiring and influential teacher. Vincent Scully, and I don't think the jury would have had any way of knowing this, was an important influence in my life. I signed up for his course my freshman year at Yale in order to comply with a distributional requirement. It wasn't my top choice. Uh, yet at the conclusion of his first lecture, I still remember my reaction. I was riveted to my chair and actually late for my next class. I didn't know ideas could be made so exciting. One memory I have is of a young student who rose to address the great man. This was very brave. Uh, and Scully um, made an imposing figure on the platform with his, his long pole a great long pole, which he banged for emphasis or to uh, signal the change of the slide or simply to wake up any sleeping student. And um, he had been lecturing that day on Mies van der Rohe, speaking of van der Rohe's handsome 999 Lakeshore Drive apartments. Well, he was lavish in his praise of the buildings. The student rose to say something like, well, sir, I live in one of those buildings. And twice in the last two years, we've had to vacate the apartment because of serious water damage draining down through the walls. <laughs> Scully, unfazed, answered with imperious certitude, functionality is irrelevant to great art. <laughs> well, I won't say that I fully agreed with Scully on that point, but I can now see that his course was 
an important starting point for my lifelong engagement with, with place, place making, and the centrality of good development to effective conservation. Generations of students were stimulated and enriched and also entertained by Scully. I can truly say generations because he is the only teacher who taught me and both of my daughters, Catherine and Megan. And Megan met her future husband, Chris Caton, in Scully's class. We're a Scully family. Libby's dad served on the Yale faculty as a colleague of Vincent Scully's. Well, after, actually, I heard an NPR interview recently with Michael Kimmelman, the architecture critic of the New York Times. He recounted that he had sat through four years of Scully's introductory lectures on the history of art and architecture, only the first year for credit. <laughs> well, after Scully, I looked at buildings differently. And my sensitivity to context, landscape, and symbolism all grew. As I reflect on the previous winners of this prize, Jane Jacobs, uh, Bob Stern, the Aga Khan, and the others, I am aware that I am punching above my, my weight class this evening. So thank you to this jury. Let me begin with a story that has a marvelous stew of bipartisan politics, productive citizen engagement with entities public and private, cost-effective investments, and beautiful buildings and landscapes. I refer to the Presidio in San Francisco. It stands alongside the restoration of San Francisco Bay as a triumph of institutional resourcefulness, citizen leadership, and practical conservation. Consider how the story began. The Presidio was a Spanish fort guarding San Francisco Bay from 1776. It had high cliffs with vistas to the west in the Pacific Ocean, and its northern beaches reached into San Francisco Bay. It remained a military post for most of 200 years. When the Army finally decided to give it up, language shrewdly inserted into a statute some 20 years before by Congressman Phil Burton provided that if the large U.S. military land holdings bordering the coast and bay were ever declared excess, that is, if the Army should see no further need for the Presidio, then it would pass to the jurisdiction of the Interior Department for Park Service purposes. When the Army prepared to depart in the early 1990s, the city and county of San Francisco and the state of California confronted difficult choices. The appeal of a landscape offering oceanfront open space where runways had been and parade grounds with spectacular perspectives on mountains in the bay. These made the Presidio a prime candidate for a park. The presence of numerous old barracks and 19th century military buildings further called out for preservation. But the presence of more than 800 buildings was a mixed blessing. Most required significant repairs. Many contained lead and asbestos. The cost of maintaining the buildings and keeping the grounds, policing and fire protection and all that, these totaled tens of millions of dollars. Accordingly, both the state and the city declined to receive the Presidio or take responsibility for running it. And so it fell to a group of citizens to conceive a plan to create a trust, to lobby Congress to approve it, and to commit the park to become self-supporting by 2013, provided that the federal government appropriated an annual and decreasing amount to finance the transition. The resulting investments transformed a military base into a premier park. The story of that transformation through a new and unprecedented legal instrument and the decisions relating to design, development, demolition, rehabilitation, and landscape improvements is one of the great modern day successes of American land use planning. The conversion of a 1,500 acre military base twice the size of New York Central Park into an urban crown jewel 
presented serious challenges to traditional park management. The Park Service had no experience with managing and no realistic prospect of financing the conversion of hundreds of buildings. At the same time, Park Service officials feared the precedent of allowing anyone else to do it. The experience and the solution of turning over a park to a group of trustees directed to design a plan that would make the park financially self-supporting were without precedent. A number of private citizens organized to consider ways to protect, finance, and manage the park. We examined several models, including the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Agency, which Senator Moynihan had championed. We worked with Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi and prepared legislation to establish a trust of seven appointees chosen by the president. One had to be a veteran. That turned out to be me. Congresswoman Pelosi and Don Fisher, chairman of the Gap, and Toby Rosenblatt, who had been chairman of the City Planning Commission of San Francisco, and I worked closely and cooperatively with then Speaker Newt Gingrich and key congressional committee chairs to lobby for enactment. Ultimately, and with Nancy Pelosi's endorsement, President Clinton included three Republicans among his seven appointees. Virtually all authority regarding the park's maintenance and development, exclusive of the shoreline, was vested in the Presidio Trust. I won't go into the stories of how we lobbied some of the senators. I recall talking to one Senate uh, advisor, Senator advisor, who said um, if he's going to tour the place, find somebody with a Harley to take him around and get one for him. You'll get him. We did. There were other great stories like that that uh, not time to go into right now. Um, the Presidio legislation committed the Congress to provide funding until in, in 2013, the park would be fully self-supporting. It is on track to meet that goal. An early achievement was the agreement with George Lucas to house digital arts and magic studio and offices on the site of two obsolescent and really ugly hospital buildings. Lucas's structure, designed by Gensler, is clean and simple and fully consistent in form and scale with the architecture of the base's buildings. And the landscaping of the Lucas Complex's campus by Lawrence Halperin is stunningly beautiful. A park within the park, green with the stands of mature trees and flowing water. As the geographer Leeson, Lisa Benton Short has written in her fine book about the transformation, the concept of Presidio as a national park is not a revolution in planning ideas or a radical redefinition of space, but rather the century-long evolution of a vision. By its fabulous location anchoring the Golden Gate, its contributions to the history of three countries through whose sovereignty it passed, the varied functions and services it provided, and to the personal pleasure it gave to generations, the Presidio came to be loved. And as Jacques Cousteau memorably said, people protect what they love. So the story of the Presidio is one of adaptation and renewal, including more than half the 460 historic buildings on the property, all of which about half, have been rented at market rates. It is a story of public policy and private enterprise joining together to realize an extraordinary achievement. And it is a story of a beloved place that inspired uncommon human imagination and energy. And we should not forget bipartisan, public-private commitment to achieving something great for the common good. Obviously, I found my own involvement with the Presidio enormously satisfying. And now I'd like to take a step back to, to share with you the context I brought to that project, and then to suggest a bigger challenge, indeed the biggest challenge of all, that all of us who think and care about the built environment now face. As a lifelong conservationist, 
I recognize as never before the power that place-based thinking has featured in my career and interest. Along the way, I had other great teachers who helped enrich and sustain the lessons I absorbed in Vincent Scully's lectures. When I was 33 years old and newly installed as president of the Conservation Foundation, for instance, the great conservationist Sir Frank Fraser Darling guided me on a tour of selected landscapes in his native Scotland. He described how the Benedictines had altered and improved and reshaped and cultivated the land. I remember in the course of that trip, he happened to notice a butterfly. He said, that's a female. The female of the species is always the more difficult to rear, you know. People, in those days, great people could say that sort of thing, you know? <laughs> and you would take it very seriously. Well, in much the same way, René Dubose inspired my appreciation of place. Dubose wrote about the monotonous, flat, gray land that once characterized the Ile de France, an area I came to know as a student in Paris. Try to imagine Paris and its environs as a flat, gray land. Dubose pointed out that thoughtful people had reorganized it, planted it, drained it, placed cities and towns in it, civilized it, and made it the premier landscape model for generations of great painters. It has remained productive and accommodating of human settlements for centuries. DeBose also said there were two human enterprises that inspired great hope in him for the future. One was the Netherlands, and the other was New York's Taconic Parkway. Both create an experience of beauty, variety, and bucolic serenity in the midst of large, densely populated urban conurbations. His key insight, DuBose famously wrote that one can improve upon nature, and I believe that deeply. Another of the mentors I most admired was William H. White, William Hollingsworth White, Holly White as he was known, best known as author of The Organization Man. And later he turned to the study of urban places and the ways in which people use them and provided us with a stunning array of insights. Using time-lapse photography, he established a number of counterintuitive truths. Pedestrians choose the most heavily crowded and traffic intersections to stop, chat, exchange reciprocal gestures, and cause people to detour around them as they engage in the long goodbye. Lovers in public parks typically choose highly visible and exposed locations to show their affection for one another. Everyone who wishes to sit down in a public place will begin by moving the chair, if it is movable, even a matter of inches to establish his or her own space. Light can be assured in the canyons among skyscrapers by attending to bounce light from windows and building surfaces. Among White's insights was the value of density of creating places and cities where other people are and want to be, where there are places to sit in chairs that can be moved, food available, people in an environment worth watching, and enough people to reassure women that they are safe. New York's Bryant Park is the place which most responds to White's prescriptions. Once a den of drug dealers avoided by prudent tourists, it is now a favorite park with cafes, food vendors, chairs and a carousel, and crowds of people on sunny days. New York City's zoning and building bonus system and even its attention to bounce light are heavily indebted to Holly White. White also wrote The Last Landscape, which examined the processes by which open farm and forest land was being consumed by development. He was a believer in cities and in the serendipitous creativity that results from chance encounters that only incur, occur in dense settlements. He lamented environmentalist pressures when new developments were proposed for lowering densities. He believed in streetscapes friendly to pedestrians, and so he made fun of banks, corporate headquarters, institutions, and other street-level activities 
that built fortresses walled off against people, the sidewalk, and their surroundings. Essentially, White aimed for design that promoted pleasure in places, places that people enjoy. He aimed, his, fun, his fundamental conviction was that urban settlements could create the conditions for creativity and delight. Nor was this mere theory. Jim Rouse understood Holly White perfectly when he redeveloped Quincy Market in Boston. I got to know Jim well as he served on the Rockefeller Task Force on Land Use and Urban Development and later on the board of the Conservation Foundation. He was best known as a shopping center developer. But he also pioneered the festival marketplace, Quincy Market, his first. He gave me a tour one day of the fruit, meat, vegetable, and flower market to which he had given over the entire ground floor of this historic building. His decision to do that was inexplicable to other big developers, some of whom openly mocked him for not really being oriented to the bottom line. As we made our way through the hordes of shoppers eyeing the low margin foods, Rouse explained to me that what the critics didn't get was that the market is the magnet. It's what draws the crowds. And later, the Rouse company reported the highest per square square foot revenues there of any urban commercial development in the United States. Rouse understood that the surrounding high rent paying luxury stores drew their ambiance and their attraction from their proximity to an exciting place where people wanted to be. Well, I was hired just two weeks before the first Earth Day by the new Council on Environmental Quality established by the White, at the White House in 1970 during the Nixon administration after passage of the National Environmental Policy Act. I was asked to draft a national land use policy law. Our small staff of five or six was sent around the country to carry the White House flag and express our environmental commitment, and I drew West Virginia. In my talk there, I tried to convey the principles of good land use and building policy. I said that steep slopes and floodplains were to be avoided. When I had finished, an old timer spoke out from the rear of the hall. He said, young feller, how much of West Virginia have you seen? <laughs> uh, not much, I confessed. He said, well, it kind of shows. Steep slopes and floodplains is about all we got. Well, at that moment, I had not yet been exposed to White or Rouse and surely could have used their help in knowing how to craft a message appropriate to West Virginia. The land use statute I drafted for CEQ created a federal grants program for states to identify and protect areas of critical environmental concern and to establish laws to assure that development of regional benefit was accommodated. In the surge of new suburban growth that characterized the late 60s and early 70s, the challenge was two-sided. It was to protect the countryside, wetlands, and historic buildings from alteration and destruction, but it also sought to ensure that with population and economic growth and the reaction against that growth in many communities, we would and could accommodate new residential and commercial development while not excluding needed facilities such as housing for low-income people or wastewater treatment plants or, or airports. The bill passed the U.S. Senate but failed by one vote in the House. The principal elements later were incorporated into the Coastal Zone Management Act. Well, I was very proud of my work and pleased that President Nixon had embraced it and proposed it. And I learned, I learned only three years ago, as my boss at the time, Russell Train, uh, recounted on a platform down at Duke University where I had introduced him, the experience of uh, meeting with President Nixon to discuss his environmental program, including my explanation of the land use law after it had been submitted to the Congress. Nixon looked at Train and said, who is the son of a bitch who wrote this? <laughs> um, well, Nixon's Attorney General John Mitchell I was later quoted apropos of the president's very progressive civil rights initiatives as saying, uh, watch what we do, not what we say. 
I put my experience at CEQ to good purpose as executive director of the Rockefeller Brothers Task Force on Land Use and Urban Growth, which produced the report, The Use of Land, A Citizen's Policy Guide to Urban Growth. The report uh, sold 50,000 copies and it, it had a long shelf life as it laid out basic principles for accommodating growth in an environmentally responsible way and offered new tools with which to approach the challenge across the country. For me, with its opening line, there's a new mood in America. The book captured the spirit of Earth Day and applied it to urban development. When I became EPA administrator some years later, I drew upon the experiences with Holly White and Jim Rouse and Bob McNulty who founded Partners for Livable Communities and the various programs, publications, and movies we had produced both at Partners, whose board I chaired in the 1980s, and the Conservation Foundation where I was president. We researched and published reports on such topics as the economics of amenity, highlighting the importance of cultural institutions in attracting professionals and corporate headquarters and anchoring neighborhood revitalization, and the concept of aging in place, which today has growing relevance with an increasingly older population. We looked at the national parks and what was needed to ensure they were maintained even as they served a new generation of visitors. Saving San Francisco Bay, Forest for the Future, a National Forum on Wetlands, which Governor Tom Kane chaired for us, and then one on groundwater, which then Governor Bruce Babbitt chaired. So much of this work revolved around place. Perhaps no action of mine at EPA was more respectful of place than a decision I made to prohibit a $500 million dam in Colorado that would have destroyed the St. Peter's of trout fishing, a beautiful canyon on the South Platte River. Not long uh, after that, at a Save the Bay conference in Rhode Island, I noted the variety of interests present, leaders in business and civic groups, restaurant operators, fishermen, boaters. It wasn't just environmentalists who turned out to champion protection of Narragansett Bay. All of them had a stake in protecting the bay. By getting together, we learned that a study of the sources of pollution pointed to the silversmiths. Now, no one wanted to put them out of business, but everyone wanted to control the pollution and people finally came together around a common plan because they all cherished Narragansett Bay. A delegation of Texans led by the chairman of the Texas Wildlife Commission, Perry Bass, once came to see me at EPA to ask that Corpus Christi be included in the National Estuary Program. The bay was a treasure, they noted, and there needed to be some forum for getting people together around its problems and how to address them. And the program couldn't include just environmentalists. This was Texas, after all. Well, I knew Corpus from my childhood years in Harlingen, Texas, and I had actually been confirmed there. I told Mr. Bass that the governor had not nominated Corpus, a requirement for consideration by the EPA. Two hours later, we received Governor Ann Richards' formal nomination. That's clout. <laughs> And when I later included Corpus Christi among some 25 recognized estuaries in the program, I received a dozen roses from Ann Richards, the only such appreciation I ever received from a governor. What the program did was simply to convene all the stakeholders and to begin the conversation among people, often adversaries on development proposals or pollution issues, but who had not otherwise even met one another. At the EPA, I asked our regional administrators to identify a series of geographic initiatives different from the traditional factory-specific or pollution point source regulations and, and the kinds of programs that, that, were, that preoccupied us so much. And I asked them to propose uh, place-based measures and funds to protect valued resources. New EPA priorities resulted from the Great Lakes to the Everglades and to wetlands everywhere. And we used our enforcement authority to protect wetlands and carry out the president's no net loss of wetlands policy, which had had its origin in that Conservation Foundation forum on wetlands chaired by Governor Kane. 
We needed to think anew, in Lincoln's phrase, where nature and its functions were concerned. In the field of conservation, Americans had done it before. Consider Yosemite, our first national park, dating from the Lincoln administration. It was, writes Simon Skama in his book, Landscape and Memory, America's first sacred garden. But unlike all previous gardens, Yosemite's protectors reversed conventions by keeping the animals in and the humans out. We needed to revive that spirit for 20th century America, and we did. In the remainder of my time this evening, I want to address a challenge that America and the entire world confront, an urgent need for adaptation and renewal. There are several dimensions to the challenge. Most dramatic are those confronting China and India, where 80% or more of the buildings extant in 2030 have yet to be built. The design choices, the quality of that new development, will affect the enjoyment, health, and productivity of tens of millions for decades to come. But even more important, the degree to which those cities are planned for long-term sustainability in the face of now certain climate change may affect their very survival. ClimateWorks, whose board I chair, is active in China, working through the Energy Foundation and the China Sustainable Energy Program. China has embraced carbon reduction and energy efficiency in recent years and is increasingly attentive to proposals to reduce carbon emissions and also pollution while saving energy. And as we all know, China is experiencing a great surge of urbanization. Part of China's response to the great rural to urban migration is to plan to accommodate 350 million more people in cities many of them new cities, or roughly the equivalent of the population of the United States. To do that in the next few decades is their plan. Well, recent preferences in urban development in China's larger cities have favored massive blocks of buildings stretching for hundreds of meters on the periphery and surrounding large interior spaces big enough to contain a number of freestanding houses. The streetscape resulting from such buildings would invite Holly White's sharp criticism, were he alive? Long walls of impenetrable concrete, no variation of use or design fronting the sidewalks, a single gated entry, and even interior courtyard distances daunting to the pedestrian and the bicyclist. None of that responds to human scale or sensible transit. When the city of Kunming began work on an addition with the Superblock plan, the Energy Foundation pointed out to the mayor, who's one of the most progressive and best known mayors in China, a grid uncongenial that, that um, the likely consequences of, of what his plan would be. Greater dependency on automobiles, a grid uncongenial to public transportation and discouraging to pedestrians. He halted work for 30 days while the foundation developed a new plan. Jane Jacobs would have approved it. Short blocks, development organized around bus rapid transit, mixed uses, more public open space, and larger corridors of shaded parks. Nor is the challenge confined to urban design. As the Chinese begin to come to terms with carbon emissions and climate change, they face a much larger challenge than we do in the United States. All of China's new households will aspire to have refrigerators and air conditioners and stoves and televisions and very likely a car. The potential for incremental increases in carbon emissions is enormous. Seen in this light, the carbon reductions China has committed to in its new five-year plan are ambitious and laudable. Well, as in China, Americans today confront a new imperative to rethink how we live. After I finished my Army tour, before going to CEQ, I worked for a group called Urban America, 
It aimed to further the vision of the City Beautiful movement, but with a dimension that movement was criticized for overlooking, the dimension of poverty alleviation and civil rights. These became paramount themes in urban policy throughout the late 60s and 70s. Today, we confront another, even more, transforming determinant of our lives and culture. Harbingers of climate change are undeniable. It may seem that climate change is last year's news, forgotten, forgotten and overtaken by understandable preoccupations with the economy, but inexorably it is progressing, even as the Congress and the country sleepwalk through it. One um, amusing aside uh, occurred as I chaired and moderated a program of the Clinton Global Initiative a couple of years ago, and one of the panelists was Jacques Regrin, then CEO of Swiss Re. And so I asked him the question, you don't manufacture anything, you don't yourselves pollute anything, why are you interested in climate change? And he said with a very nice French accent, he said, well, um, we noticed that Shanghai, in which we do business, is likely to be inundated in many parts of it in the coming years. And I said, and so do you still insure buildings in Shanghai? He said, the tall ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are beginning to see action in industry and also in state and local governments. Once again, a very promising response is evident, is starting in many cities. The foremost among them is Chicago, which under former Mayor Richard Daley considered its changing climate and moved to plan and prepare for it. A one-week heat wave in July 1995 killed 739 people, more than double the death toll from the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. The city mobilized its leadership and produced a comprehensive and detailed set of prescriptions to guide future development, the Chicago Climate Action Plan. Its assumptions regarding anticipated climate change are simply stunning. As someone who grew up in Illinois, it strikes me that within the lifetime of my grandchildren, the place may be unrecognizable. Consider the forecasts which show shocked Chicago city planners. Assuming worldwide carbon emissions continue, Chicago will have summers like the Deep South, with as many as 72 days over 90 degrees by the end of the century. The city averaged 15 such days in the 20th century. Under a high emission scenario, the city can expect 45 to 85 days per year with temperatures over 95 degrees. By 2070, Chicago could expect 35% more precipitation in winter and spring, but 20% less in summer and fall. These conditions will have altered the area's plant hardiness zone to that of Birmingham, Alabama. The city could see heat-related deaths of 1,200 per year. Increasing incidents of freezes and thaws will add costs of millions more in road maintenance and repair. And termites, previously controlled by Chicago's winters, will dine out on the city's wooden-framed housing stock. The policies adopted in the plan are significant. They require water-permeable pavement that can catch 80% of runoff, greater tree cover that modulates and absorbs a good percentage of rainfall, light-reflecting pavement with rubbery additives that allow expansion without buckling, installation of air conditioning in public schools. The city aims to double tree cover to 23%, up from 11% in 1991, remove six of the most common tree species from the arboretum, and as the city plants some 2,200 trees per year, ban the state tree, the white oak, and the Norway maple, substituting swamp white oaks and bald cypress, familiar to the deep south. These responses to predictable climate change strike me as prudent and manageable. Retrofitting offices over the past few years has already saved Chicago $6 million in energy costs. The plan considers that their new initiatives will save them money. They have been developed by a practical, non-ideological mayor's administration. Mayor Daley Chicago has led the cities in responding to climate change, but other cities, in fact, more than a 1,000 of them, have signed on to the Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement, 
among them Seattle and San Francisco, San Antonio and Little Rock, Phoenix and Newark and Los Angeles and Richmond and Anchorage and Washington, D.C. Few cities have gone as far as Chicago, but many, in the words of Melissa Stultz, climate director for the mayor's group, have followed a strategy of discreetly integrating preparedness into traditional planning efforts. This is promising. This is progress. This is how practical leaders do what they can while the country and the world wait for the United States government to make carbon reduction and climate mitigation a priority. And though Chicago's efforts aim to reduce carbon emissions from their city, their plan necessarily focuses more on adaptation than on mitigation of climate change. Former Governor of California Arno Schwarzenegger's Task Force on Adaptation and his Blue Ribbon Task Force on the California Delta, the rivers that flow through Sacramento into San Francisco Bay, on both of which I served, I chaired the adaptation one, concluded that the incidence of severe storms, the loss of shorelines to wave action, and the sea level rise of 55 inches by the century's end, together with an increase in forest fires as temperatures rise even one degree or two degrees, portend significant changes in the life circumstances of the state's people. For example, such a sea level rise will inundate 1,100 miles of levees that protect some 150,000 people in the Delta. One member of our task force who had overseen the National Academy of Engineering's after action review of Hurricane Katrina, Ray Seed, predicted that the coincidence of a major storm and water surge in the Delta would cost more lives than Katrina. This prompted our Delta commissioners to recommend in our report that every new home in the area be required to have a door opening to the roof. We decided against recommending that each new home be required to have a boat in the front yard. Uh, actually, actually, Ray Seed proposed that based on the Katrina history where neighbors with boats saved more people than official rescuers did. A rising sea level will confront states like Florida and Alaska with especially serious decisions regarding relocation, armoring the shorelines, whether to build big levee systems, and so on. It has seemed to me that if Castro were to threaten to take even a small portion of the Florida shoreline compared with what sea level rise portends, the mobilization of resources to repel the incursion would be limitless. Yet in Florida, as in many parts of the country, mention of climate change or global warming is politically incorrect. Cities across the country, and especially the Southwest, are going to have to rethink water use. It's very encouraging to see that that is possible. Seattle, Los Angeles, San Antonio have seen growth in their populations of millions of people without any increase in total water consumption. The City Beautiful movement early in the last century was born of a concern to counter the ugliness of a frenzy of urban growth. Its proponents, progressives with standards and a desire to both clean up city governments and improve building design, had a far-ranging impact. Today, it is time to unite behind a new cause, the city sustainable, an effective and galvanizing successor to the City Beautiful movement. Its stirrings have already begun in Chicago and many other cities. Its demands for reduced water use, greater energy efficiency, for better insulation and green roofs, for reflective pavement and climate appropriate vegetation and more tree cover and a more congenial environment for pedestrians, bicyclists and public transportation, all this is part of it and all this can be accomplished. In fact, it is being done, as I mentioned. Its success may save us for a time from the ideological gridlock in Washington. For America, as we transform and armor our cities against severe floods and extended droughts, against killing heat waves and snap cold spells and winter storms, 
against water scarcity and stressed power generation, we have choices. We can learn the lessons of successful placemaking and combine them with the imperatives of preparing for a new climate. These are not insuperable challenges. As I look around America now, I'm struck by how powerful are the portents of change and how Americans' responses to those portents can be so different. All of this will require new urban policies. Our response to climate change is not solely the province of environmental or energy policy. It is very much place-based policy in the best sense. And it will require a change not just of city planning, but of the culture of cities. We're looking to accomplish here a reconciliation of nature and culture under very new and challenging natural circumstances. It will require all the wisdom and creativity of the public and private sectors alike. But we should do it. I will close with a quotation from the distinguished Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan. I really love Moynihan. Uh, no one was more fun to testify in front of. You never knew the, the connections he would make. I testified once before him on risk, and he said, Administrator, you are quite correct to bottom your regulations and your objectives on reducing risk, but I caution you against trying to eliminate risk entirely to get to zero risk because remember life is about risk and it ends badly <laughs> well the quotation i had for, for him with which i will close is this in some 40 years of government work i have learned one thing for certain the central conservative truth is that it is culture, not politics, that determines the success of a society. The central liberal truth is that politics can change a culture and save it from itself. Thanks to this interaction, we're a better society in nearly all respects than we were. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we do have some time for questions. We've got about five or 10 minutes for questions. If you can raise your hand, uh, we will bring the mic to you. Thank you so much for your history of the environmental movement with regard to the urban environment. I have a question about a very compelling current issue. And with my deepest respect for your amazing background and your compassion, I would seek your suggestions how to get us out of this. I'm speaking of hydraulic fracturing deep into the earth, into the shale, which is also known as fracking. Recently, this past weekend on Saturday, and I'll make this quick, there was an unprecedented earthquake about 40 miles northeast of Oklahoma City, 5.6. We recently in nearby Virginia had an earthquake, magnitude 5.8, which we felt here in Washington, D.C. We are seeing more earthquakes and more seismic disturbances due to fracking. Yet fracking is being touted as more jobs, put people to work, but it is consuming fresh water that is being stolen from communities in order to feed the hundreds of millions of gallons of water needed to do fracking. Fracking is polluting local water supplies, so companies have to now bring in 
tanker trucks of fresh water because they polluted the water locally. That is destroying the roads and using tremendous carbon fuels just to transport water. What, as my question then is, what is our way to cope with the destruction of our Earth by this incessant deep fracturing of the shale layer that causes seismic disturbances? Is there any way out of this? Thank you. A very timely question. There is a, a new project forum that has been created by the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, on natural gas, on all of the dimensions of natural gas. And in so many respects, it looks like heaven sent that we have uh, discovered a capacity to have more than 100 years of natural gas. Fracking, as you say, though, is the, is the way that that gas is being extricated from the formations in which it lies. It lies typically well below the groundwater. So if the casing in which it's brought up is properly laid, then there should be no intersection with the groundwater. That has not been true in every case. And one of the points I would make is that this is an area in which if there is not some way to police those who don't know what they're doing, they're going to discredit the enterprise. It's going to be another Macondo. And we've seen that the oil and gas industry has quite properly accepted the recommendation of the Oil Spill Commission and developed some, an entity that's designed to police the outliers. And everybody knew BP was one. The, um, the future of, of fracking, I, I, I suspect, must, to, if it has one, uh, depend upon a system of regulation that connects the hydrology and the geology and the water system. And, and what happens, which most concerns me, it isn't that it pollutes the groundwater, but that what is redone, done with the residual water. Now, increasingly, by the better practitioners, it's being re-injected. In, back, into the, back into the wells. And it takes about uh, what a golf course would take in terms of water for each, for each fracking well. Um, they're finding ways to clean it up and to reuse it. One just assumes that's a no-brainer in America in 2011, that you reuse something like that. Um, I suppose in, in defense of those who have pioneered it, it's a relatively new uh, technology being applied to, to gas and to its extraction. There are some places in the country where the wastewater treatments are uh, technically capable of dealing with the various toxics. There are many parts, particularly in the eastern United States, where they frankly aren't. Now, that's, that is, in my view, a serious problem. And that, that uh, is going to have to be dealt with. EPA has begun a, uh, I think it's an extended, uh, an in-depth study of alternatives to address some of those issues, but they're serious. And they do bring into play the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, and, and some other statutes. So I think that will get a much more uh, attention in public policy than it has had, and it deserves it. Do you think, sir, the, that the current craze for building golf courses as a, any threat for, uh, <laughs> for our environment. Well, you are, you are looking at a person who discovered once on an airplane by the conversation with a passenger next to him who was reading Golf Digest that I was once the 14th most important person in the world of golf. Um, I don't play golf. Uh, it turned out in reading why I was uh, in that illustrious position, it was because I was uh, determined I was judged to have destroyed the uh, prospects of golf course development uh, more consistently and effectively than anybody in history. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I did this uh, with uh, occasional veto under the Clean Water Act, but more frequently using the bully pulpit. Uh, we had a policy of no net loss of wetlands. It was one very dear to my heart. It was to the president as well. And so we came down very hard. And there's something about golf course development, which really loves a wetland. Uh, it's often right on the coast. It has marvelous views of the sea. And it, very often, it's pretty cheap, too, um, until it's been drained. So uh, and of course, uh, you all know, it's a nursery for three-fourths of the fish in the sea, wetlands. So it's very important. And uh, I've never been a fan. They also are uh, huge water users particularly in places that uh, don't have a lot of water to, to use or waste. So um, 
that's a, that's, that's a very personal uh, take on, on a perfectly legitimate sport, one that happens to be particularly popular among Republicans. So, this is, so, it's, a, so, so it's a tricky thing for me to say, and I better leave it right there. speak on the Chesapeake Bay right in our backyard that seems to be being ignored? Well, th we, uh, when I speak on Chesapeake Bay, uh, Chesapeake Bay was a very important part of, uh, of our uh, priorities, our, those, those geographic initiatives that I described. And we did make progress in terms of um, oh, biological oxygen demand and, and uh, uh, green cover uh, um, on, the, on, the, on the seabed and um, some other measures. We, we had several that were going the wrong way uh, or we we're just barely holding our own on. The real problem there is, is uh, nitro nitrogen oxides, both from some extent from automobiles, but mostly from runoff from farms, pesticides, even, even in places like, like uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and, you know, just to make an analogy, I live in San Francisco and, and have since, since 1993, but uh, so I've not followed it as closely as I used to, but the, I happened to, to be at a, an outdoor barbecue in Iowa um, last summer and was amazed that the hostess gave a little speech and there were a lot of us from out of town who were there and she said um, one of the challenges confronting farmers in Iowa was to concern themselves with the runoff of nutrients which was ruining much of the Gulf of Mexico for much of the year, the dead zone. And I was, I was startled to see that there was this sensitivity in Iowa to the Gulf. And um, I learned later it was a program that we had started in our time down in the, in the Gulf to try to get conversations going upriver from the areas that really were affecting, affecting it. And I was fascinated a few years ago, Ken Cook's Environmental Working Group discovered that using modern technology of um, uh, identifying from aerial uh, positions, uh, runoff, which can be done, they discovered that 16 counties accounted for more than half, or close to half, of all of the nutrients flowing down the Mississippi. And I remember thinking at the time, if it's 16 counties, it's a much more uh, accessible problem than we had thought. You could fix that. You could fix it with the Farm Bill and the kinds of subsidies that are in it and redirect some of them. Uh, I, I don't know what the same kind of technology would show relative to the Chesapeake, but it might be similarly um, awakening, encouraging to a different approach. And I would, I would be very interested to see something like that tried. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, the Keystone XL pipeline, uh, if that decision were yours to make, what do you think you'd do? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Aren't we going to have some drinks? <laughs> you know, from an environmental point of view, um, the Canadians are very determined to have a pipeline. They're very determined to develop their oil sands. Uh, even one of their officials made clear they will go, they will compensate with more nuclear development, more nuclear reactor power uh, reactors, if necessary, to accommodate it. And um, one Canadian told me, and a Canadian, uh, Canadian oil uh, guy said, look, uh, as far as Canada is concerned, it doesn't matter where it goes. The Chinese and the Japanese really would love it to go to Vancouver and come straight to them. Uh, that's a possibility the Canadians have, and I suspect that as the president and the administration look at it, that's one of the things they're thinking about. Do we, do we bring it into the United States where it's... Um, where it would be refined and, and will help deal with our balance of payments? Uh, or do we or do you simply say no to it and let the Canadians move it across to Vancouver? I think that's the choice. And I guess as an environmentalist, uh, when, you, when you look at it that way, and, I, and my particular orientation has been carbon dioxide in recent years, not so much the, and I'm, I'm aware that building a pipeline like that is going to entail an awful lot of rivers to cross and a lot of sensitive areas to traverse. Um, but uh, that makes it a harder choice for the president, frankly. And um, now I think it's time for a drink. <laughs>
Thank you. I just want to thank all of you for being here this evening. I hope you enjoyed the program. You will note that we actually have an award that we're giving to uh, Administrator Riley, but we didn't want to get our fingerprints on it, so there it is. Um, please join me in congratulating Administrator Riley one more time for receiving the Vincent Scully Prize.